that that's a point in there? Yeah, am I visible in the camera? You're visible. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Sprasnikov. Sprasnikov. Means greetings on the feast. <clears throat> which we, we, some people say Christ has ascended in glory. Is that right? From earth to heaven. From earth to heaven. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of a, a, new, a new one. It's not really uh, firmly in our tradition yet. This is the second of a trinity of feasts which describe our salvation. So there's lots of feasts to describe the beginning of our salvation and such, like, like Nativity, right? Uh, all the feasts of the Theotokos before Nativity, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Annunciation, all those things. But the three feasts in the Paschal period, they describe the end result. The end result. So as God is a trinity, there is a trinity of feasts describing our salvation. First, we are risen from the dead. Christ rose from the dead, so we will rise from the dead. But if we rise from the dead with the same bodies we have, that's of no use whatsoever. Because our bodies are broken. And also our souls are broken. So our bodies will rise with God, uh, to be with God. The ascension tells us that. Our body and our soul together will rise to God. That's what the ascension teaches primarily. And, well, there's something else to it, and I'll get to that in a minute, which is so unspeakably beautiful. And then the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is given to us so that we are illuminated, so that we can know things of God. So we need perfected bodies, perfected souls, and we have this trinity of feasts which describes our end state in the heavens. And the most important thing that ascension teaches is not just that Christ ascended into heaven, all right, that's a historical fact, but that Christ's physical nature, his human nature, his perfected nature, ascended into heaven, and this is a promise that we will ascend into heaven with a perfected nature, perfected human nature. Now there's other things about the ascension that the Christ said he wouldn't send the Holy Spirit until he left. So if he was still with them, he would not, they would not have the Holy Spirit. So this is present in the teaching of the ascension, the meaning of the ascension. Also, of course, the second coming. And uh, that the disciples should get to work afterwards because they were kind of uh, upbraided by the angels. Like, what are you doing? Just standing looking there. There's really work to be done. But the primary teaching and the most beautiful teaching and the teaching that has energized all of the saints more than the resurrection is that we ascend into heaven to be with God and be perfected. So one could argue, if you want to argue about such things, that the greatest feast of the church, you could say it's ascension. You could say it's the resurrection. You could say it's Pentecost. You could say it's all three. And I think any of those are fine because ultimately we are going to be with God with a perfected human nature, which includes our physical and our spiritual nature. And this is a beautiful thing. Now I'm always telling you read the Psalms, read the um, not Psalms, of course. I'm always telling you to read the services. Very important. I've read now the Ascension service two times over besides celebrating it last night. It's unspeakably beautiful. And when you read it, as well as listen to it in, in church and pray, it's very, very powerful. So I hope you all take me up on this. Some of you have. Some of you, uh, you're still just hearing me talk about it, and it's going to take another 180 7,000 times before you decide to actually start reading the services. But I will be very happy after that 187,000 time. I'll have a crutch, you know, and my voice won't be very strong, but, but hopefully by that time you'll be reading the services. I want to tell you 
the, how the service describes the ascension of man into heaven. So really, the ascension of Christ into heaven is the ascension of man into heaven. Is a prophecy of our ascension to heaven. And I cannot speak of this too strongly. It's impossible to overstate this, that knowing that we will be with God and be perfected, maybe she can learn how to turn it off. Knowing that we will be perfected, body and soul, is the energy that makes us do everything. That's what caused the saints to do great feats of asceticism, the martyrs to, to give up their bodies to God, to, to God through torture of those who did not believe in God. Though it causes a man to be humble, to be kind, to be good, to be chaste. This is the power that the engine that drives us, knowing that we will be with God and be perfected. So you cannot think about this too much. Let me go on a little excursus. You know, it'll be my first one this year. <laughs> so, when I was becoming Orthodox, I didn't understand. I came from a very sterile doctrine. It was just kind of legalistic. Then I was an uh, evangelical Protestant preaching on beaches to people for a little while. And that seemed hollow and shallow, although it was, it was fervent, but it, it didn't just explain a lot of things. Then I come to orthodoxy, and in orthodoxy we are constantly talking about God as Trinity, invoking the Trinity, and saying all these very theological prayers constantly in our private and our public prayer. And I didn't understand it. It's like, okay, God is Trinity. Fine, I get it. God is Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I get it. The creed is the definitive document which describes the dogma of the Holy Trinity. I understand that. I didn't understand, though, that when you meditate upon these things, Day by day, over your life, they change you internally. They enlighten you. And by meditate, I don't mean sitting with your legs crossed and thinking about them. I mean acting upon the fact, the eminent reality, the, that or imminent reality, that Christ and the Father and the, and the Spirit are one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and that God, who is unknowable, makes himself knowable to us because he wants to. And he does that through his son becoming like us. And then perfecting that nature, which was broken. You cannot meditate upon this too often. That's why I'm always telling you, read the scriptures, read the lives of the saints, read the services. All three of those are really shall we say, a trinity of sources that are describing the same thing. They're describing the redemption of man. They're describing the fulfillment of our purpose, which is to be like God. We are made in his image. We are to become like him. You cannot meditate upon this too much. You cannot read about this too much. You cannot uh, say the Psalter too much or read the services too much and uh, be amazed at the beautiful poetry which describes our redemption. And if you know who you are, then you will be able to do great things. We can see this in the world. That when people don't know who they are, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to act. And then someone comes along and says this or that, and they're double-minded men, unstable in all their ways, and they have no idea how to live. Someone says, this is the new truth, and they say, that's the truth, and carry a sign for that. And then a year later, this is another truth. Oh no, forget that truth. That truth is now in the garbage bin. And uh, in fact, the truth never happened. We didn't, I don't know what you're talking about. This is the new truth. This is the only truth. This is the immutable truth. And then another one comes. That's what happens to people in the world because they don't know who they are. And it happens to Orthodox Christians too because they don't know who they are because they live very lackluster lives. I don't want you to do that. I want you to live powerful lives. 
I want you to live lives that are full of awe and wonder at what God has done for us, that he, the unknowable God, has made himself knowable to us, and we're terrible and sinful. Our services, our, our phronema tells us that, and it tells us, at the same time it tells us that, it tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we'll be perfect, body and soul with God in heaven. Wonderful. So let's look at a few things from the um, canon last night that describe the raising of human nature. There's dozens of things, but these are the things that really kind of bounce, really just grab me. They always do. Thou didst go up to the Father, O Christ, bestower of life, and didst uplift our nature in thine ineffable compassion, O thou who lovest me. Seeing human nature ascending with thee, O Savior, the ranks of the angels were amazed and unceasingly now, regarding the angels, the angels are, at this point, more intelligent than we are. But there's things they don't know that we will know, and even that we know now that they don't know. But when we are perfected body and soul, we will know more than they are. We will be with God. We will be united to God. The angels are not technically united to God, but they are all around God and worship Him and know Him. And they have free will and, and give their love to God uh, in return for, from, from his love. But they will not know this mystery from the ages of union with God. Only we will know that. And the angels from the ages, from the time they were created, were, and then when man was created, the universe was created, they were aware on some level of God's plan, but they didn't fully understand it. And then when man, when Christ is ascending into heaven with a human body, they were amazed. Because this is just inexplicable. It cannot be understood. But it is going to happen. It happened with Christ. It happened with the Theotokos after Christ. And it will happen with all of us. And it cannot be understood. The angels don't know it. We are higher than the angels by an immeasurable amount. One could say right now we're lower than the angels because we're encumbered by our sins and our passions and our sinful flesh and our sinful soul. But when we are unencumbered by those things, we will be much higher than, than the angels. So that's why that's mentioned. And it's really a, a glorious thing. Then it says... Basically the same thing again. The choirs of angels were filled with awe of Christ, beholding the unborn in the body, and they hymned by holy ascension. So the angels are hymning right now. They're singing right now. There's an eternal liturgy happening, and we're going to join that liturgy. Eternally worshiping God, eternally full of life, eternally with God, eternally learning more of these mysteries, which cannot be fully understood. But they can be understood to a greater extent, to an ever-increasing extent. Because the created cannot understand the uncreated. But we can come pretty close. And God's going to make that happen over the course of infinity. Or should I say infinity and beyond. Huh? That's what my grandchildren think the biggest number is. So also, Thou didst exalt human nature, which had fallen through corruption, O Christ. And by thy descent, thou didst lift it up, and didst glorify it with thyself. I like this so much because it mixes the two things that I like to think about the most. One is my corruption. Yes, I like to think about that. Because when I think about it, I also think about how God by his incarnation, is lifting me from that corruption. So there is deliverance coming. So those are the two things that I, I like to think about most in the world. My corruption, and that God will lift me from that corruption. 
And the process of lifting me from my corruption is that process of from the incarnation onwards. Christ assuming our nature, perfecting it, teaching us how to live, assigning his apostles, being crucified, defeating death, then resurrecting himself so that we would be resurrected as well. And of course then ascending to the heaven, showing that we will be with him in heaven, body and soul, and of course sending the Holy Spirit so that we would understand all these things. Despite my corruption, which I see every day, when I fail to do something, or I do something I shouldn't do, or I think something I shouldn't think, or whatever I'm doing, so much corruption is present. I see it in my own life constantly, and I hope you do too, because if you don't, then you haven't really yet learned how to be a Christian. You have to learn to see your corruption. But not in a way that you're saying, I'm a terrible person, I can't be saved. No, that's, that's from the devil's lips to your ears. From God's lips to our ears is, you are a terrible person, but I love you. And I've chosen you. And I'm going to make you incorrupt and perfect. That's the message. So if you look carefully at our services, you will see this message of being raised from incorruption to corruption constantly. Just on a given random Tuesday, you will hear it. And of course, you will always hear it in the resurrection services uh, for Sunday. But any day, you would see this. Now here's another beautiful image. I tell people I don't like poetry. I really don't. <laughs> I, love your, I, love the, I love the church's poetry. For the most part, I, I don't like poetry. You, you hand me a book of poems or something, I don't. I mean, I can use it as a doorstop. I don't like it. But, I mean, I'm just a Philistine. I really don't, you know. I find Shakespeare to be totally boring and stupid. I don't like it. Um, Emily Dickinson, oh, my goodness, it's like watching paint. But there's a few that are good. There's a few that are good. But the poetry of the church is about my salvation. <laughs> so I'm really interested in it. And I love the turns of phrase. I love the uh, hyperbole. And I love the repetition, which is so present in my poetry. I love the em emphatic nature of it. I love the brutal honesty of our poetry. I love that. That's why I love to think of my corruption and my incorruption in the same breath, because the church does that constantly. So here's an image, and I think you should probably think of the same one that comes to my mind immediately when you hear this. <clears throat> Taking erring human nature upon thy shoulder, O Savior, having ascended, that is bring to God the Father. Doesn't that remind you of the shepherd and the sheep? The lamb that has gone astray, and he seeks for that lamb. All the other ones are doing okay. <laughs> They're the angels. They're doing okay. But that one lamb, which is human nature, he's searching for that human nature. He's searching for you. He's going along the road, looking for you on the roadside, almost dead because you've been attacked by thieves, and you're bleeding out. He's going to you. And then what's he going to do? Well, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, he puts the, the uh, man on, the, on his beast, which is the equivalent, really, of putting out the man on his shoulder. Like those beautiful icons we see that the Lord has a lamb on his shoulder. Or, you know, carrying a lamb on his back. What a beautiful image. We can't do anything by ourselves. Absolutely nothing. We're so weak. But God can do everything. And God can carry us. He can take our every human nature upon his shoulder. And he'll bring us to glory. He will bring us to eternal life. And we will be perfected and we'll be with him. Now, if that doesn't motivate you, there's really nothing in the world that will. This is the, the beautiful reality that we are in. And so many people don't know it. It bothers me so much when I see Orthodox or, or people outside of the church thinking in such a legalistic way. I can do this and it's enough. What? How can anything be enough? to return the love that God has given us. It's never enough, and yet it will be enough in the end. But we shouldn't think, this is okay. I can just do this. No, we should be mounting up like eagles. We should be 
strong and, and energetic because of this reality that God's going to raise us up perfected. He's taking our erring nature upon his shoulder. He's taken us from the road when we were bleeding and dying. We couldn't love him, but he loved us. And then we love him. What a beautiful thing. This is what the ascension is doing. Or what the ascension is, is uh, well, it is doing. Because it's, of course, promising us, since none of us have ascended yet. But it is also that, that energy in you that causes you to, to not give in to temptation. And not only that, let's not say it in a negative sense. Christianity is positive, not negative. It causes you to do wondrous things. It causes you to, to do things, as the Lord said, that were greater than his things. Greater things than these shall you do, he said to his apostles. It applies to us as well. When a man loves with perfection, that is the greatest miracle. When we act as God acts, that is the greatest miracle. When our soul is placid and pure and, and clear, that's the greatest miracle. And that can happen for each one of us. But of course, in the meantime, what are we going to have to do? We're, we're going to have to be carried by our Lord. Just as our children are carried until they're of age, until they can, uh, uh, until they can walk and run, and then watch out for them. We wish you could carry them sometimes. One more. Assuming our nature, which has been slain by sin, O Savior, that is, bring it to thine own Father. We just basically talked about that. Our Lord took on our nature. It had been slain by sin. Our Lord was born to die. Now, he was not a sinful man, but he was born under sin. And he allowed his body to go the natural course. Of course he could, because he's God, cause his body not to die. But it was the nature of his body that it would die, because that's the nature of human bodies after sin. So he did allow that to happen, but without sin, without that uh, necessity that is, is upon us. We die because of sin. Jesus Christ died because of our sins, not his sins. He chose to die. There was no necessity for him either. He chose to die. He allowed himself to be crucified and to die. And then he took our erring nature to the Father as a perfected nature. What a beautiful thing. Sometimes I wonder, how is it that we can sin today? I mean, with this beautiful manifest reality happening in our hearts, how, how is it that we are jealous? How is it that we're unkind, that we have a lustful thought, that we're lazy, that we, we think a bad thing about somebody, that we're bitter, that we're angry, that we're cruel? How can that be when this is before us? That's a real mystery to me. I don't really understand it. But unfortunately, we are still living with corrupt parts. There's parts of us that are still dark. But also, parts of us are becoming light. And eventually, there will be no darkness in us at all, because there's no darkness in God at all. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. So it will be the same with us. We will have no darkness. We will only be light, and we will be body and soul with God, perfect body and soul with God, since Jesus Christ is perfect body and soul, human body and soul, as well as being completely united with his God. Okay. That's the teaching of the Ascension, and that should energize you. So if you get anything out of this uh, long-winded sermon, I would say that you should pause every day to recognize how beautiful God is, and how impossible it is that you would know God, and God makes it possible, because with Him all things are possible. And how, despite your corruption, you're becoming incorrupt. And that that should energize you, that should make you so grateful, you should want to change because of that. As I've told you many times before, there is not one legalistic thing in the Orthodox Church. Now there's legalistic people. There's people who don't understand things. There's people who say, oh, I don't have to fast because that's for monks. Or blah blah blah. There's all that. There's all stupid human tricks. 
in, because there's stupid humans in the Orthodox Church as, as well as that, right? But there also is no thing that's legalistic. There is no, nothing we do where we bargain with God to get something. The whole reason for good works is because we're going to ascend into heaven. We're resurrected, we'll ascend, we'll be with him body and soul and be perfected. That's the entire reason for good works. Not because you must do good works to be saved. You do good works because you are being saved. That's the beauty that just so much of the supposed Christian, Christian world does not understand that. But we do. And we understand it because we live it. We live it, we pray it, we read it, and we preach it. And that's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? What a glorious thing to be a Christian. God bless you.